Welcome everyone to Virtual Insight, Material Witness, artists from the collection at work. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this virtual walkthrough and conversation about material witness, folk and self-taught artists at work. Please know that self uh, closed captioning in English is available by clicking uh, on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. I'm Mathilde walker Bio, Curator of Programming at the American Folk Art Museum. I'm joining you today from Queens, New York. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that our museum stands upon Lenape Hawking, the unceded traditional homeland of the Lenape Delaware peoples. We honor Lenape people, past, present, and future, and are committed to centering indigenous perspectives in exhibitions and programs at the museum. As many of you know, a farm is dedicated to uplifting the work of self-taught artists across time and place. And we're thrilled to celebrate the creativity of singular artists and talents with our current exhibition, Material Witness, Folk and Self-Taught Artists at Work. Now on view at Two Lincoln Square until October 29th, featuring a large range of media, including ceramics, works on paper, paintings, marble and wood carving objects, as well as textile works. Spanning from the 18th through 21st centuries, this show explores how artists learn with and through material engagement in ways that often exceed conventional frameworks for artistic training. So this is the first series of thematic shows drawn from the museum's collection, generously supported by a grant from the Henry Luce Foundation. This series of exhibitions invites us to admire the museum's collection up close while showcasing an expansive history of American art. So I'm so pleased to be joined by the curator of this series of collection-based exhibitions, Brooke Wyatt, who is here on the screen. So Brooke Wyatt is AFAM's loose assistant curator. And today she will walk us through the four sections of Material Witness with a focus on the artist's working processes and unique trainings. After a presentation, Brooke will be joined by her collaborator, FM's collection and exhibition associate, Lisa Maki, who contributed to the design of the exhibition. So this conversation will offer viewers an opportunity to learn how objects from FM's collection are prepared, installed, and displayed for exhibition. Before I turn it over to Brooke and Lisa, I'd like to add that the walkthrough will be followed by a short Q&A. So I invite you to share questions for speakers throughout the talk using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I will be using the chat room to share more details about the speaker and the program. Today's program is being recorded and will be made available online in the coming weeks. Many thanks to our IT director, Richard Ho, for technical support today, and to all of you for being here and joining us today. We're grateful for opportunities like this one to connect online, which will not be possible without you. I hope you will consider supporting our program through a donation to the museum following this conversation. Your support has great impact and makes a difference in our ability to champion the work of folk and self-taught artists. Thank you. So now I'll hand it over to Brooke Wyatt. Please welcome Brooke. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Um, and thank you, Mathilde. Uh, thank you for thank you, Richard, for your for your support. And Lisa, thank you for joining me. Um, it was really important to me for this curatorial walkthrough program to also um, include the perspective from our collections team, because Lisa and I worked so closely on this exhibition. Um, and because the nature of this show um, entailed so many objects of so many diverse materials from the museum's collection, that the actual, um, the process of planning to install these different kinds of material objects in this space um, was just as much a part of the experience of, of curating the show as was, um, you know, looking at the objects in storage and, and doing research about them in archives and putting together the checklists and everything like that. 
the actual installation process really brought things to life. So I'm going to start by walking through the sections of the exhibition. Um, and then Lisa will will join me and we'll have we'll share with you. Um, we'll continue the conversations that we've been having around the objects in, in the exhibition. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, the material witness, folk and self-taught artists at work is divided into four sections, three sections and a case study, in fact. So um, I've got examples on this side of one work from each of the sections that really illuminates the idea that I'm exploring in that part of the show. The first section is called From the Earth. And there, we're looking here at a, at a portrait painting of, of a woman by the artist Jimmy Lee Suddeth, who used a mixture of clay and mud and pigments that he drew from berries and axle grease and grass clippings and all manner of, of different um, sources that he, that he experimented with and innovated over time mixing those together with various binding agents that he also innovated and developed like syrup, sugar-based syrups. This is the liquid that he mixed with the pigments to be able to apply the paint to the surface. He also mixed in conventional house paint, um, but this idea of pigments being drawn from, from the earth itself in terms of uh, raw materials in terms of um, minerals and oxides. And in the, in the work of Jimmy Lee Suddeth, for example, the actual earth, the actual mud and clay and dirt that he mixed in and, and used the, the, the coloration of. Um, so this first section is really, it's really focusing on artists who work with materials that are drawn directly from the earth, whether that be clay that's used to make ceramics, um, wood that grew, you know, that grew from, from trees. Um, and, and the section includes portraits like this one because I'm thinking about how pigments themselves, what give color to paint, um, usually originate, at least natural pigments, um, usually originate some, somewhere in the earth itself. So the second section, um, is exemplified by the image in the top right corner of this slide. Um, this section is called Matter in Hand, and it's about process. It's about how artists work with the materials that they choose. Uh, whatever, those, whatever those are, this is about the studio practice, the working process. Um, so the image that we're looking at here is by an artist named Consuelo Chelo Gonzalez Amezcua. This, this work is entirely made with ballpoint pen. And her, the artist's process that I was focusing on here is this very detailed, very intricate process of building up these lines with the pen over time so that you get this almost embroidery effect on the paper. And if you are looking closely, if you're standing in the Cowan Gallery at Two Lincoln Square in Manhattan in New York, looking at this artwork, and the light is just reflecting off the paper, you can see all of the little rivulets and valleys from every place that Shalo has impressed her pen um, over and over again, creating this image. Um, and it's, she, she actually called her practice filigree art. So, so this is section two, matter in hand, where it's about process. Section three is in the spirit and in sort of the bottom near the right hand, center to the right hand side, you can see a photograph of silver prayer charms, milagros, that are probably from Peru and that are made out of silver. And in, this, in the spirit section, thinking about how artists and makers use materials as conduits as so that the objects that they make and the materials are are sort of a means to an end a way of channeling or communicating with um, the divine with the spiritual realm or the natural world 
perhaps with supernatural or um, sort of superhuman powers and life forces. And then mixed in here is a case study called Al Alchemy and Light. And it's an exploration of photography and how photography, in this case, hand tinted um, 20th century vernacular photographs, like the one that's, that we're looking at here in the bottom left-hand corner of your slide, um, as well as 19th century cased photographs like daguerreotypes. And thinking about how photographs operate both as images and as objects, whether they be paper or on a glass or a metal plate. Um, so lots of ideas to weave through. And if we could go to the next slide, please, Richard. Thank you. We're gonna start in section one from the earth. Um, and again, here I'm thinking about the raw materials that artists use that are drawn directly from the earth itself, often pigments and clay. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, this is a, a work of redware, Pennsylvania German uh, redware from Southeastern Pennsylvania. It's attributed to George Hubner. And I wanted to start with this work because it's, a, it's sort of a pivot point for the entire show. Now this first section is called From the Earth, and I borrowed that term from what the, the ceramicist has inscribed on this plate in, in Pennsylvania German. Um, from the Earth, with his great skill, the potter makes what he will. I actually want to push back against some of the ideas that are communicated in this quote. So I so material witness is about the, the raw materials that artists use, the process and practice, the ways they use them. But then I kind of wanted to flip the script and think about materials like the clay or the earth in this case that George Hubner is referring to, not just as passive substances that artists with their great skill and mastery exert their will over, but also that materials can act as teachers and that between the artist and their chosen materials is an ongoing relationship and one of exchange um, and one of, of learning. So for example, although George Hubner, the potter that made this, this plate talks about uh, potters making, uh, making what they will from the earth because of their great skill. I thought a lot about how clay is so, uh, is so malleable on the one hand, and at the same time, very demanding in terms of teaching us how it can be used, how far it can be stretched or how thinly it can be rolled out before it will crack. At what temperature, for example, can it be fired in a kiln before it will explode? Um, additionally, so in addition to actually using the, the clay from the deposits in southeastern Pennsylvania that Pennsylvania German redware like this is drawn from or was draw from, drawn from and still is, um, those, those clay deposits have very particular levels of mineral content that are specific to that region. So a potter working with that clay also has to learn over time how the, the different mineral compositions there are going to affect the things like the kiln temperatures and so on. Um, also, the color that is, that is in the glaze here are draw, is drawn from pigments, from mineral oxides um, as well. And so also that this deep knowledge accumulated over time of how artists um, learn not just refining their skills and how they kind of exert their will on materials, but also learning through this process of reciprocal exchange. And if we could go to the next slide, please. This is the other, this is a group of works, um, all made of marble that are in this, in, from the earth section. And the artists that made these are not necessarily the same person. We don't know who they are. They're not identified. Because of the material being marble and because of um, 
these, the content, so the alphabet plaque on the left here, and this lamb, this, this seated or recumbent lamb on the right, um, it's very likely that these objects were carved by tombstone carvers or memorial masons in the 19th century. And um, so we can imagine that maybe on the left, the carver is practicing lettering for their profession of carving names into tombstones. On the right, um, the lamb imagery is very prevalent in the graves of children um, during this period because of the lamb's symbolic references to innocence and purity and things like that. Um, so, however, these, these objects themselves were not used in, in a cemetery or funerary context. They are, they are quite small, um, especially this lamb. And they almost seem like they were made uh, from scraps of marble, it could be, as practice carvings perhaps, or as perhaps as tokens to be given as gifts. Um, so started thinking about um, stone carvers working as, you know, carving as their profession, and then also working with their materials in other ways, just outside of what would have, have a use um, in their professional life. And we'll, and we'll see a couple more examples in just a moment. But first, if we could go to the next slide, I wanted to share some photos from a trip to the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn back in November, where I saw many recumbent lambs and was very excited. Um, they're, they're worn down by, by the weather and the years, but in the center and on the right, um, you can see examples of these kinds of marble um, lambs in, in an actual cemetery. Um, and on the left is a marble heart that I'm holding to show the size, um, and I and I think it's a very it's a very related object to the ones in in AFAM's collection that are included in Material Witness. And if we could go to the next slide, please. I was I also really wanted to include these two marble objects in this group. Again, it's it's still very very likely that these were carved by memorial masons or tombstone carvers. But here there is definitely not a um, commemorative uh, or memorializing function. There's actually humor. The idea of carving a book out of marble, as in the, the object on the left, that even has the title marble book incised on the spine and sort of faux embossed leather detailing carved into it um, is pretty funny. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an ingenious uh, and creative use of a piece of scrap marble that might have been left over from a tombstone. And on the right, it's very large, this object, and very heavy, as, as Lisa and um, other colleagues can attest. This object would be uh, so cumbersome to use in hand washing um, that it, these would be made of wood, usually. So to, to carve a washboard out of marble invites us, I think, to imagine the maker seeing this piece of marble and thinking, oh, that looks like a washboard. I'm gonna actually make it into one. It doesn't have a purpose per se. It doesn't have a, a use or a function besides existing as this curious material object. So it was definitely going in the, in the show. Uh, next slide, please. So moving in to section two, Matter in hand. This is the this is the area in the exhibition where we're really focusing on work. Uh, the title of the exhibition again: Material Witness, Folk, and Self-Taught Artists at Work. Um, is is again, it's an invitation, as I see it, for us to not just not just think at and look at artworks as finished products or masterpieces, if you will, but to think of the process and the work that went into creating them and to value that on an equal footing as well. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. 
the artist Charles Butler um, carves out of part various hardwoods these intricately detailed uh, wood wooden sculptures showing a range of themes from biblical themes like in the uh, the work on the far left here to contemporary themes the the sculpture in the center, the center image in this slide, appears to show a person standing at a podium speaking on a mic. So we've we're, we've got about two thousand years at least, um, at quite a bit more actually. Um, let me. My math is way off. Seven thousand years, maybe more, um, in terms of Butler's range of time periods that he's depicting in wood here. And then also I want to draw your attention to the detailed um, and intricate carving that the artist has done, geometric carvings and organic forms, borders, outlines behind the figures. Um, and if you look closely in the image on the far left, you can see he's also uh, carved his name, Charles Butler. Um, so, you know, these these are examples of wood carvings that we would, you know, wouldn't shock anyone, I think, to find in a museum in the sense that they they appear like finished products and they're mounted on these small pedestals. But for material witness, we we wanted to dig deep into the museum's collection and show other aspects of Charles Butler's practice that had never been shown before, but that were part of, you know, in care in the museum's in the museum's storage, such as the artist's toolbox and set of tools. And I want to you know, emphasize that he made these all himself. Richard, if we could go back to the previous slide really quickly, you can see in this installation view how in Material Witness, we included these three sculptures by Butler. We included his toolbox and tools and his work table. So we're just inviting everyone to, to not only enjoy the artist's wood carving and his range of styles and motifs and um, subject matter, but also to see the craftsmanship that went into the making of his, um, his toolbox, the tools themselves, um, and, his, and his work table. And if we could go, to the, go forward to the next slide, please. It's, it, uh, yes, we can we can go here. We're, here. Here is Charles Butler himself holding one of his tools as well as one of his, his artworks on the left. And on the right, you can see a detail of the lid of the toolbox. And this was really exciting. If you, if you look at this image, imagine that you're looking at a geometric creature, maybe with two arms reaching up and, and you know, other arms or legs reaching down and an almost an anvil shaped head where you would picture the eyes to be on this creature are, are the letters CB, Charles Butler. Um, and a shout out to, to Judy Steinberg um, in, in our collections department who, who spotted that. So another kind of trace of the artist's process uh, left behind. And if we could go to the next slide, please. Okay. Um, this is a work by, Ju by Judith Scott, and um, she's an artist whose, whose work I've been um, <clears throat> really fascinated by and uh, researching for, for a while, so the chance to get to um, directly work with her, with her sculptures um, in person at the museum has been a dream, a dream come true for me. Um, so on the right, we're looking at a photograph of the sculpture that is included in Material Witness. And the photo on the left is just a detail, a close up of the yarn um, that Scott used to, to make this work. And Lisa and I might talk a bit later about some of the, the our thoughts that went into how this work uh, was installed ultimately in the show. Um, but what I wanna focus on at this moment is the process that, that, that Judith Scott used to, to work with these materials, exclusively fiber, yarn, uh, string and cloths, as you can see here. And then also I wanna call your attention to the knots, to the wrapping, to the weaving. Um, and if you, if you have, or if you do have a chance to see her work in person, you can literally get lost for hours 
tracing, you know, imagine the, the, the documentation almost held as the artist works her way around these forms. There's some kind of armature, there's some kind of structure inside the soft fibers, but we often don't know what it is. And if we could go to the next slide, please. <laughs> um, sometimes we do get a glimpse into what it is. This, this um, work by Judith Scott on the, on the left is not in AFAM's collection, but I, ha I had to show it here because it's a shopping cart that Scott has um, just, just filled, filled to the brim and ensconced in this cocoon of, of yarn. Um, and you can see you can see Scott working uh, in her studio on the on the right in a photo. Um, some of her work has been x-rayed, in fact, you know, and we don't to see what is inside when it's not obvious, when it's not, you know, when you can't see the shopping cart wheels peeking out. And, you know, I know we don't think twice about x-raying, uh, you know, a work by Rembrandt or Vermeer or um, artists where, you know, we want to see what the underpainting was or what, what was erased or painted over and things like that. And um, I have to say that material witness and working with Judith Scott's work and just being in the presence of these objects, I think if we could go back one, Richard, um, just being in the presence of this object in particular um, and talking, um, I want to give a shout out to Mariani Guzman, who's, who I've been working with, um, this, this year and this semester in the Museum Careers Internship Program at AFAM. Um, Mariani is an artist herself, and we've talked a lot about what is inside here and this sort of human nature desire to want to know. And then we, we kind of, we say, let's take a time out, let's pause, because why do we need to know? Is there a value or is there something um, to not knowing or to respecting that this object in and of itself exists as sort of a, uh, has its own has its own presence and has the, the history of the artist's making process embedded in it that we can observe closely. And in the case of Judith Scott, there's documentation of her working. So we know that she worked on a tabletop and that she manipulated and turned the objects around as she was weaving and wrapping. We know that she gravitated towards the same materials again and again, yarn um, and fibers. But we don't know what, for, what Judith Scott might feel like about us extraying her work or about really how, how the extent to which she might agree with some um, practices of installing her work in exhibitions that have involved hanging it from the ceiling or suspending it on wires. Um, Judith Scott didn't communicate through verbal or written conventional language. Um, she was deaf and her deafness was, was undiagnosed when she was a child and she was institutionalized. Um, she had Down syndrome and in the, in the 1940s, the doctors felt that that was, you know, how she would get the best care. The result was that she spent four decades separated from her family. And eventually her fraternal twin sister, Joyce, um, was able to get Judith out of that institution in Ohio. And this, and in the early, early 1980s, Judith went to live with her sister in Oakland, California. And, started working as an artist at Creative Growth, which still exists, one of the longest running um, art studio workshops um, for artists with disabilities. Uh, now there are, there are quite a few all around the world, but four of the original um, studio workshops like this started in the Bay Area. And so this is, you know, this, this process, it, it's pretty radical. Um, for us to be able to, to see Scott's work in, in our museums now. Um, and it's definitely um, a testament to the disability rights movement gaining, gaining traction and the movement for deinstitutionalization and, and so on. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of rich history woven in, 
<clears throat> to the story of these works. And then also, um, again, this, this space for not, for not knowing that I, that I hope that this exhibit invites us to start grappling with. We don't have to maybe know all the answers. So there could be some knowledge that's not, um, not meant to be shared. And on that note, if we could go to um, slide 15, Richard, one more, thank you. Um, this collection of so-called memory wares, it's another great example of a, an opportunity, let's say, a, to, to pause and to reflect on the mystery that is kind of, that is contained in these objects, in these hundreds and hundreds of small personal tokens and objects that a maker, probably one person, has, or the same person in, in all three cases, have affixed to the outer surface of these ceramic jugs. Um, this is a this is a craft practice. You may have seen, you may have made um, objects like this yourselves. We're seeing these in craft fairs or antique shows. Um, I believe some some of the some like this may have appeared in Antiques Roadshow. Uh, the Smithsonian has has some in their collection. Um, they're 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 right on the on the border, moving between a craft practice, almost like scrapbooking, and and fine art practice, like um, sculpt sculpture, abstract sculpture. So, again, they they might have a memorializing function in the sense that the objects on that have been adhered to these vessels might be have belonged to a person who's 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 passed away and moved on to to the next life. So this may be sort of like the, what remains on earth, if you will, as a testament to um, the story of that life. Uh, and again, just an invitation to, to grapple with the way that materials and, and objects, like many in EFM's collection, uh, embody stories and histories and memories. Um, some of which we can relate to and we can imagine, and some that we that we can't know. Um, and that is definitely a segue into the next section, the next slide, please, which is um, the case study, the focus on photography, and thinking about how photography is made of of alchemic processes uh, and light, and um, in terms of alchemy, you know, uh, the kinds of um, lead and tin, and again, these 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 metals from the earth that formed the basis for early photographic forms, um, like daguerreotypes, that involved passing a silver plate through mercury vapor, you know, in in the in the process of of the kind of exposing the image, um, those kind of those kind of practices, I, I was astonished to learn how they relate back to the earth again, because at the same time, in the creation of these images, and I guess in, in the, the digital and smart smartphone world that we're in now, um, we experience images as, as very ephemeral and very fleeting uh, at the same time. Um, so just to look a little deeper into this section, if we could go to the next slide. I wanted to keep the focus on work uh, in this exhibition and on working with materials and tools, um, metal and, and yarn in these examples. Uh, and I was just thrilled to find in, in AFM's archives a, a it's not a daguerreotype on the left. It is, I think it's an ambrotype. I can check, I can check later or if, if we have any photography experts, please, please uh, chime in. But we're looking at a blacksmith working at their anvil with a hammer and a horseshoe. On the right, we're looking at a, a, at a woman knitting, a blind woman knitting. Um, this this collection that, that of, of daguerreotypes, ambrotypes, and tintypes that I included in a material witness has many has many um, people with 
with their tools of their trade. There are musicians posing with their instruments, for example. There's a leather worker with his tools. Um, so, so that was that was in keeping with the, this kind of focus on work. And then in the next slide, we have another example of um, a 19th century early photographic form. And in in, we see this, this image of a child holding what looks like a chalkware dog, like a Staffordshire dog, very similar to the one on the right from AFM's collection. So I did not include this, this dog in, in Material Witness, but the, the early photography is included. But I thought that today was a great, a great chance for this poodle to make an appearance um, because it, it really had me thinking about, as you can imagine, I was finding all kinds of co uh, connections um, between our collection and archives and library. And the show having over 155 objects, um, there were a lot of opportunities to make connections between different materials like this one. So I was thrilled to see this, this chalkware plaster of Paris sculpture appear in this photo, this photograph, um, for example. And then also, yeah, kind of crossing these boundaries between materials and medium again. So you have the photograph at once, an image, and then also an object itself documenting a, per, a person and and this object which perhaps also referenced you know a family pet or other stories um in the next slide we can see a couple more examples from this collection like a bracelet made of human hair and if you're familiar with hair work um it's a popular popular practice especially um in the 19th and early 20th century this, this bracelet includes a daguerreotype photo in a locket um, and it opens. And then these examples of pins um, with photographs in them, I was thinking now you can, you can wear and bring with you not just these material objects and the photograph of your loved one possibly, and also, you know, their their hair is part of the material object. So this idea that then um, they can go with you and these objects can go with you made me think about how, again, how photography is not just an image, but also, you know, acts as an object. Um, and so the next slide, which is the last example from this photography section, uh, this was, this was really exciting, um, an opportunity to include a selection of hand tinted photographs um, from various photographers, all unidentified, mostly from, from the United States. Um, and the common denominator being that they were hand tinted, meaning that they were painted with water or oil-based paints and more than likely, this was a process that was done at home. And again, I don't know if anyone uh, tuning in today has ever done done hand tinting of photographs. But um, as photography became more accessible, um, as cameras became more uh, portable, like you can see the um, the figure in the in the photo on the far left is holding a, a camera. Um, so you know. Production of photographs themselves um, didn't have to just happen in studios, right? People could be taking snapshots like, like these. And then similarly, hand tinting was something that could be done at home with kits that could be purchased at the drugstore, for example. So when color photography was either not invented or not available yet, or it was still quite expensive, hand tinting was a way to add some uh, another dimension to your photography. And it could be and was often done professionally in studios, but it was also done at home. So um, here I was again thinking about now we have all these additional layers of materials. We have the photograph as the image and as the object in these, in this case on, on, on photographic paper. 
then we have the paint and then we have the the intervention of the decision making process of the artist who's holding that paintbrush and the history of the of the marks that they made over time um okay so i do i do hope that that some of you will have a chance to visit the show in person and see and see some more of these examples. And if we could go to the next slide, please. The last section in the spirit, as I mentioned before, is crossing over not just between materials, but between, between dimensions and worlds. Um, and in the next slide, an example of a work by the artist J.B. Murray on the right. And there's a photograph of a bottle of, of water that belongs to the artist that's also included in this show. Um, and just to give you a, an example, if we go to the next slide quickly, here's J.B. Murray on the right holding this water. Um, he's standing in the doorway to his home and you can see um, on the far, far right of the slide, um, panels of wood and pieces of paper that Murray has painted on and then affixed to the wall of his house. On the left, the television set that Murray has painted on, that was one of his first paintings. He was, he was painting on windshields of a car and, and it, uh, there's two television sets, I believe. And this idea of the windshield and the television screen as these transparent and convex objects that are also the, the transparency and the fact that things can pass through or not. Um, if we go back to the previous slide, this is this idea of transparency and some things being hidden and some things being revealed is something in Murray's work that I really wanted to draw out. This practice, Murray's artistic practice was essentially a spiritual practice. Um, so the water in the bottle, um, a, a handwritten script that Murray invented and that he himself may have been able to read, but that, uh, that wasn't legible to others. Um, and then symbolic use of color, bringing all of these elements together. Um, there are some aspects of his, of his practice that we can understand and, and and we can certainly enjoy these works as beautiful paintings and also kind of keep in mind and, and make space for the fact that this was also a spiritual practice the um murray's depicting epic battles between good and evil between possibly at this stage in his life uh cancer attacking cells in his own body um and at the same time, um, just a just a this tension again between what is what is hidden and what is revealed, and a tension between what is what is art and what is more than art, or not just art, or art and something else. Um, so just to just to conclude in the spirit, we could go two slides ahead right here, um, this, this object that we're looking at on the right um, is one, is in, is in material witness and is one component of a much, much larger installation that the artist Emery Blagden called the healing machine. And this is Blagden pictured on the left. Now I, I, I call it him an artist. I, I don't think that Blagden himself identified that way and nor do I think that he, thought of his of the healing machine as a work of art <clears throat> but if we go to the next slide you can see the exterior of where this healing machine was housed and the interior there were some 800 components of these constructions um, there were some paintings and Blagden had lost both of his parents to cancer and he believed that these assemblages of objects and these particular materials could channel the Earth's electromagnetic forces and kind of harness healing or protective 
functions or powers. And he invited neighbors um, to come into the healing machine and experience the its healing effects. Um, and again, this, this idea of materials being conduits or um, channels um, for protection, for healing, for moving between worlds um, was really something that I wanted to draw out. So if we can go to the next slide and we'll ask Lisa to join us in our next few moments we're going to shift gears to, to talk about the perspective from collections on what it was like to put together a show of over 155 objects of so many different kinds of materials. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Brooke. Thanks for, thanks for letting me join you today. I'm really excited to talk about this with you. You know, I've been talking about, well, we, you know, you and I have been having these conversations for, for many months now. Um, and today I've been talking a lot about we don't know who the artist is and we don't know what's inside. And um, maybe it's, you know, an organic material or maybe it's, uh, there's lots of, um, lots of aspects of, of this museum's collection that are, that are, I would say fairly unique. Um, if you wanted to share, share what it's, what it's like to, to work with this kind of a collection. Yeah, absolutely. Um, AFAM's permanent collection of the artwork only, not including our archives and libraries, over 7,000 objects. Um, as you've said, from things we might normally expect to find in a, a traditional museum, like furniture and paintings and photographs, um, to objects of unexpected materials, like we've covered a bit today, um, which uh, one of my personal favorites in our collection is a Nellie Mae Rose sculpture made of bubble gum. Um, but we also have um, works made of various organic materials, um, basically anything you can think of. Um, so it's a very interesting and wonderful collection to be able to work with and presents a lot of different questions and challenges about how to best care for those materials and display them, which is a lot of what we talked about. I, I loved um, in our conversation recently when we were talking about organic materials and I think how you, you, you mentioned that one of the memory wares, one of the, actually there's a picture on the left here mm -hmm. of those ceramic vessels encrusted with objects. In this picture, they're coming out of storage. Um, you mentioned that there's a peach pit stuck on one of these. And then I said, oh yeah, and the hair work, there's human hair in the collection. And it was funny because you said, well, hair is actually pretty stable, I guess, <laughs> compared to other things. Yes, very true. Which speaking of stable, I guess if we want to go to the next slide, one of the, the things that we spoke about a lot in this, um, both from a curatorial perspective and a conservation perspective, is having works on paper on view, especially books, um, and that the Spangenberg Bible, which we can see on the left, was on view for three months. And that is really the, the limit of time that we prefer to have works on paper that are this fragile on view, um, especially the Bible. Um, and so in this case, we had a lot of discussions about what we would swap in its place. Um, and as we can see in the right slide, we have the punch bowl has now replaced it. So if anyone has visited the show um, prior to June 21st, you would have seen the Bible and now you'll be able to see this punch bowl. This just happened. This is like big news um, at AFAM, or at least at least for material witness. Um, yeah, maybe if we go to the next slide, we can look a little closer at these objects. Um, and as Lisa said, in, with the object on the left that started off for the first three months of the exhibition, um, it's it's a book, it's a Bible. So so thinking about the binding itself and not wanting the book to stay open for too long as this could put pressure and stress on the binding materials. Um, but then that the reason why this particular object is is so valuable and is part of our collection is because um, of the fractor or the the ink painted um, 
painting, which is bound within the Bible. So that's that's what we're looking at on the pages here. And if we go one more slide ahead, we can see some details of this. And this fraktor is a tradition that was 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 brought from Germany by Pennsylvania German communities, the same um, group that we were talking when we were looking at the redware plate by George Schubner at the very beginning in the in uh, from the earth section. So here, just details of how, how old you can see the dates inscribed. Um, this, this essentially was commissioned, sort of like a family history, a family registry um, kept in the family Bible that was commissioned by Jacob Schaefer. Uh, he commissioned the artist Johannes Ernst Spangenberg to create this factor. So, um, just, yeah, just to show the detail, this is actually, you know, it's very fragile. So if we can go back one slide. Uh, since since the fractor and the Bible was on display with the other Pennsylvania German uh, redware, and then with some other examples of fractor um, in the show, um, but because of the, the presence of those redware ceramics, we, we thought it would be a great swap to and a great opportunity to show another work of ceramic of different kind, this this punch bowl, which is on on view now, and to highlight the cobalt blue um, pigment drawn from the earth as well. And I don't know, Lisa, anything else to add before we move on to the the world of mounts? No, I think this is a it's a great time to move on to <laughs> to that. Perfect. So I, I was just talking about the redware plates and on the top left image where you can see the horse running and you can see um, the plates with their mounts. Um, you can also see the recumbent lamb um, <laughs> on the far right of these images. Lisa, can you can you tell us what we're looking at? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Brooke and I worked really closely with how we wanted to display these objects um, in a way that would be really visually interesting, but also safe for these objects. As you can imagine, the marbles are quite heavy and the plates are very delicate. So we have um, mount makers come in and they make custom fit mounts to hold these objects. So on the top left, you can see the plate mounts very slightly coming over the front of the plates. If you were to see these in the exhibition today, They've since been painted out in order to minimize their appearance. Um, so you can experience the plates almost as floating against the walls. And that's the same idea that we had for the marbles. We, I think Brooke was really excited about having kind of that parallel of these objects um, right. kind of coming at you. And the mounts that you can see in the picture with the recumbent land have all been custom made to fit these marble objects in order to hold them into the walls to account for their weight. Um, and they, the metal of the mount is then covered um, with a softer material in order to not scratch the metal. And they are also painted to match the objects. So it's a really seamless experience um, that we can look at in the show. Yeah. Um, and, and just, Kudos to, to you, Lisa. This is these mounts are an example of, you know, the idea of making a slab of marble float on a wall is um that is the that is the genius of, of collections and in particular just you know AFAN's collections team in working with the diverse materials that make up our collection, where you'd even be in the position to be trying to float a marble washboard on a wall. Um, Yeah, we did. We, you know, uh, as a quick note, if we if we cast our minds back to the fiber artist Judith Scott, whose work we were looking at uh, in the matter in hand section of this show, um, you know, Lisa and I, we you and I discussed how we have the whole set of stands and mounts for the Judith Scott works that are in AFM's collection and. And I mentioned how I, I've seen her work installed hanging from the ceiling or on kind of tension wires. And you know, the it's always it's always exciting to get to see different angles of the, of the work. Um, but we decided 
for this show and in I think you know conventions for for Scott's work in general are moving towards um, not using those stands, even you know even custom built stands and mounts, um, because again everything we know about the artist's intention, if we can call it that, for for these objects, is in in Scott's case embedded in the objects themselves and then we and then whatever documentation we have of her making process um so again since as i mentioned she was working on a table um in her studio every day uh we wanted to show the work on a on a flat surface parallel to the floor in that sense so lisa you had a this was just one of many pieces of exhibition furniture that you that you had to source um from storage and but it was it was our it was our attempt to kind of to foreground the artist's voice and making process and in that sense their agency as much as possible absolutely i think that that really shows in i believe it's our next slide for the philadelphia wiremen um brooke can speak to us speak about you know these works a little bit but they came with a lot of these mounts that were made for the objects um, initially, but um, it's a similar consideration with the Judas Scott of about uh, we really wanting to center the the artist's intent. Um, in this case, the artist is unknown, and so we had we did a lot of thinking um, about the best way to display these objects. Um, if Brooke, if you want to tell us a little bit about the artist, sure. Um, let's let's go to the next slide. Um, so you can see the 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 end result on the right of the the wall case, Lisa. This was you're doing. This came into being um, through your ingenuity and and our conversations about the history of these objects and and then decisions about how to realize a way to show them and include them in the show that um, would at least gesture or create some space. Uh, so to kind of hold that unknowingness again, because the artist is unidentified, as you said. Um, let's go back to the previous slide, please, just so we can look more closely. This artist is referred to as the Philadelphia Wireman. However, um, the artist's identity has not been confirmed. And this is, we, we kind of saved, I don't say the best, but we saved perhaps the most wild and intriguing story which continues to unfold for last. Um, something like 1200 of these sculptures were found um, as this as the story goes in an alleyway in South Philadelphia on trash night in the late 1970s. So the details of um, who found them, what what that individual was doing, like you know kind of looking through the trash <laughs> and on and on and on um is you know is, is in some aspects are lost to history but these this group this huge group of of objects ended up in the care of the Fleischer Ullman gallery in Philadelphia and they they started showing these as artworks in the early 80s and they have made their way into collections around the world at this point um in our museum and you know in the Smithsonian and many other many other places. Um, for material witness, it was really exciting. We had seven of these works in the museum's collection when the show was in the planning stages. And by the time that it went on view, an additional gift of 15 works rounded out the number that we have in our collection now to 22. So if we go to the next slide, Again, you can see all 22 were on view in Material Witness. So, so Lisa had to come up with a, with a display option that could house all of these, reunited after many years. Um, and then we also, like as Lisa mentioned, some of them had mounts that had been um, custom made for these particular objects, yes, but not made by the maker. So because we do not know who the artist was, who the maker was. We don't know why these were made, how they were used, 
how they were stored or displayed or or not displayed or any any of these kinds of things. You know, we don't know that this that the maker was a man. Um, so we wanted to show these. We, we we kept some on their stands, so you could get a sense of what they were like. You know, in space, since you know we we couldn't invite viewers to actually pick them up and hold them and turn them around. Um, but we also wanted to show them without stands and in some cases on blocks so that they are, you know, you can see different heights and different angles and they can be in relationship to each other in different ways. Um, but this was a, um, it was a, it's a, you know, perhaps deceptive how challenging I think and, and uh, like, like each of these, like each of these objects, right? Like, the, the closer you look, the more you can see that there are just endless um, mysteries in, included and ensconced in all of these. Yeah, I think that's that's what makes, especially working on a collection show so exciting um, and the basis of, of our work together. And um, I was very excited to be able to join um, today to, to talk about this. Um, because it's the same questions materials are asking us in, in terms of display and care. So it's a really great experience to work together with Brooke on this show. Yeah, this with, with this these Philadelphia wiremen, so-called um, objects, having this case and the option of the blocks or the mounts, we could put the objects into relationship with one another and then also invite all of the viewers, all of us as viewers to enter into that kind of relational exchange with them when we look at them. So yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lisa and, and everybody that um, that worked on this on this show. It was a, uh, <laughs> again, 100, over 155 objects, every material under the sun, so. Thank you so much to both of you for your time and your really generous presentation. It was really wonderful to have you both in conversation. Also a privilege to look at the objects through the practice of conservation, care, and display. I think we learned a lot about the collection and also about your work behind the scenes. So thank you so much. We have a lot of questions and um, also I would like to encourage everyone on the call too. Uh, share more questions and comments uh, for our curatorial and collection team. You, they are not here often, so take uh, take advantage of, of them right now. Um, we have some questions about um, the last artist you uh, you were uh, talking about, um, Brooke G. B. Murray. G. B. Murray. Um, I think uh, there are a lot of questions about the the role of the bottle um, water, the water bottle. Sorry, and. Um, and what role it may have served. Um, also, the, this, this question, this relation to the color um, and, uh, and the meanings of, of the color, the symbolic meanings of the color. So if you can just yeah, share a little bit more information about this artist, I think uh, there's a lot of interest. Yes, I, I am very interested in J.B. Murray's work as well. And I, and I have to admit that this, it, it's, a, it's a research project that um, the, you know, I guess it's something I, I, I'll be working on and for, for the rest of my life, I think. And again, never, you know, never knowing the answers because I, um, I'm not going to be able to ask J.B. Murray. Um, he's not with us anymore. Um, what his what his whole um, what's the word, cosmology of and, and system of meanings uh, that he ascribed to different colors was exactly um, what the the script that he included in many of his works, what he was you know, writing or what the relationship between that writing and um, you know, the meaning or the message or the perhaps protective factor that some of these objects had for him and his kind of belief system. Um, everything that we, that I am, am sharing about this artist um, comes out of interviews that were done uh, with him is primarily by one person, William Arnett. Um, if if any of you are familiar with the Souls Grown Deep Foundation, um, that 
is a, is a really sizable entity that in, in their collection includes works by numerous, numerous self-taught artists um, from the US and they have, they have made many gifts to, to AFAM's collection as well. Um, and so, you know, soulsgrowndeep.org is a, is a website where you could look up J.B. Murray and, and read William Arnett's writing about his, his conversations with Murray. And uh, you can read Arnett's account about the colors, the meanings that, that Murray attributed to different colors and, and things like that. Um, it was Murray's doctor who started giving him larger pieces of paper, standard sized paper and possibly paints and things like that. Um, so let you, you can identify that a work is later in Murray's uh, life because of, you know, like, like the one included in this show is on pink paper. So um, I guess what I'm trying to communicate is that, you know, even just not knowing what the, did Murray think about these objects as, as artworks or was this part of a spiritual practice? The water bottle itself was maybe something that he he held to read the script or even to give a sermon, perhaps, of interpreting the artwork. But um... yeah, that's a, a nod. <laughs> and we have question also about the warrior men or the Philadelphia warrior men sculptures. <laughs> yes, you see, we, we all have questions about this work. Um, so um, some, someone would like to know if um, who made the months, if you have more information about who made the months, if they were gifted that way, or if a fam recently uh, made some, uh, you know, so that was a question about this. And also all the, um, the months that you've been doing and constructing for the exhibition, are you going to reuse them um, and for uh, other exhibitions? So that's a, probably also a question for you, Lisa. So um, also in general, not only for the wire men, but um, sure. for the so the, the wireman did come with the mounts. Um, I think as Brooke mentioned earlier, a lot of these were on view in galleries um, and in private collections. So they would have been displayed on these mounts. Um, at AFAM, we, whenever something comes with a mount, we generally do keep that in storage um, alongside the object in order to display it. Um, but I think as Brooke mentioned with the Judas Scott, we do have mounts that were previously used, but based on scholarship, we've we've decided to not use them in this exhibition. And I think that that is the case even for the custom mounts and different pieces of furniture that we use in our exhibitions. We do we do keep them um, in the case where something would be displayed again. We can use it, um, and in some cases, those mounts are able to be used for other objects in our collection. Um, so we really are thinking about that a lot uh, when we when we organize these exhibitions. Um, another question about the about the covers. Uh, so you know some some works you shared book earlier in your presentation. Um, are there still some stone carvers in ma marble and other types of works? Do you know if they are still practicing this art? So do we know if um, carvers are yes, still? Yes, if there are still like tom tombstone carvers existing today. Hmm. That's a, that's a great question. I don't I don't know anything about what's going on these days with with that that practice. Um, there's a there's a an artist in our collection, William Edmondson, um, who who worked as a tombstone carver and um, his sculptures are, are not often made for marble. He was making these, this is like in a mid 20th century. Um, but at this, at this point, I don't know, but this, but this crossover between, you know, many of the art, many, if not all of the artists in Material Witness and many in AFAM's collection made you know, were, were if they were working in the arts as their profession it was doing something like tombstone carving they weren't making art for their own purposes as their full-time job most of the time or many artists worked many many other jobs and came either came to art making late in life or um, 
only only had time or resources to be able to focus on it in the last decades decades of their life. So this this show actually includes a number of objects that were made within the last one year, last five years of of the artists' lives when they were really you know finally finding time to to focus on their on their work. And um, someone also asked about the, um, this graffito plate that you showed earlier in your presentation. They had question about the, the saying or the writing on the dish. Right. Um, I, I shared what's a really rough translation or maybe like um, an anglicized version of, of the message. So, um, but it's written in German, but in but in the kind of the, the form of German or the dialect of German that that was spoken by Pennsylvania German communities. Um, this is in the late 18th century at this point, I, I believe, in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, and it's a it's a it's one of these unique objects in our collection where the maker reflects about their their process in it records that in the object itself so there's there's kind of this meta level of um you have the object you have the plate and then you have the artist um talking about the process of making the plate so it's the uh, inscription reads something like from the earth with his great skill the potter makes what he will so I think that's been, you know, kind of put into a more poetic form in English. Um, reading the German, it's it's a much longer sentence. I was just looking at it earlier today, being like, hmm. um, so. Um, but yes, also the idea of there's a duality there between a utilitarian object and then an object of of beauty, and that's also a a tension or a boundary that I wanted to, to push or explore with material witness that by all means it could be both, right? And also that um, some of the ideas we have about what is a finished pro product or a masterpiece again, or a museum quality object or even a functional object or a work of art that, that all of these categories and boundaries um, I guess are only as, as productive as, sometimes they're mostly productive as things to push against and to, and to question. At least that's what, that was what we were up to with this exhibition. But I think your, your exhibition really, um, you know, is, is, a, is a great example of how rich our collection is and also all the tension that are created through this object that as you, as you said and, and, and shared today, there's a lot of unknown about those objects and that's what is also make them so fascinating and so interesting to work with and to look at. So, so thank you for that. Thank you for, for sharing this 